Hi, this is Ben Schwellen. Since we're talking about languages which come from the landscape of Britain today, let's go for a walk outside. Let's go. What if I love Brythonic languages like Welsh, Cornish, Breton is because I love the landscape that formed them. And there are three here you see, but we don't exactly know if there was a fourth or not. There's something called Cymric. And for anyone who speaks Welsh, that's quite an eerie sounding name and how and how familiar it is because we call ourselves Cymru Welsh people. Cymraig is the name of the language. Cymru is the name of the land. And it comes from the same Romano-British root that formed Cumbria. But here's the thing. We don't know if this is a separate language or a dialect. And I want to run through you now and explain some of the differences and some of the similarities. What we have and what we don't and enjoy a bit of this fine landscape as well, as I like to do on this channel. So we're talking about Cymric, which is it its own language or is it a dialect? That's a question we've not really answered or linguists haven't really answered yet. And my, my concoction from all this is that what we're looking at are two different languages. What we have are mostly in, across the south and middle of Scotland, Welsh. I mean, most of this is Old Welsh, basically. And then up toward Glasgow, you get, you know, names start to change a bit and the old Brythonic place names. And this looks like it was beginning to emerge as another language, but it never quite fully got there. Down all the way into Lancashire, you get names like Pendle, which is, you know, it's, it's Welsh. And these pen names are scattered all throughout the area of where Cymric would have been spoken. Place names are a great way to try and piece a language back together. And there are a lot of places in North England and Southern Scotland which have significant abundance of Brythonic or native British place names. Just to give you an idea of how the problem of solving what is and what is not Welsh here is very, very difficult because what we may have is just a far dialect of Welsh, but we don't know. Blind. Now, this does mean like a, a face or a front of today, and it's changed over time. But it means summit or a protruding hill in this case. So you get names like Blind Kogal, which became Blind Kogo over time. And this one's interesting because it gives us plurals. So the O W at the end is exactly what A U is in Welsh. I, oh, that's just a dialect difference in the plural. But you get this in Cornish as well, the O, W ending is quite a common plural form. And what this means is the hill of the cuckoos. Blen Kogo. And then you get Blen Kethra or Blen Kethra. And that Kethra means chair. And in Welsh, it's Kadair. 
or it would have been Keder. Blen Keder. And what this means is the summit of the chair-shaped mountain. These names are quite descriptive. One that you see all over the place is Kar, which is would have been Kair. And that vowel squeezed over time, probably. And my favorite, probably one of these is Kardernak, which in Welsh would be, or Cymric, Kardernog. And what this means is the stronghold of the knobbly or gnarled fist-shaped fortress. I like that. Bath gate. It's interesting that <laughs> they took it to mean two English words which mean nothing at all really. But what it means is bath coid. Boar's wood. The trees of the boar like a wild boar by the coid. And you get coid elements all throughout this area. The names were quite early before that D hardened fully. And that may be another difference between Cymric and Welsh, but we're not sure because they're not always the case. Coombe is one that you'll see all over Wales when you go. And what it means, it's more of a bowl-shaped valley or general word meaning valley, cum divok. What do you think this means? This suggests it comes from Brythonic rather than Welsh or Cumbric, because in old, well, Brythonic, it would have been kumba, dubokos, meaning dark or black valley. And over time, it would have become kumba, Dufok. There's no bra there. That doesn't mean that it wasn't there. There's no evidence. In Welsh, it would have today become something like Kumdi. But that V sound, Divog, it was obviously a bit more conservative, and Welsh was the one that changed. Black Valley. Kumdivog. One that you see all over the place is different variations of Eglois. Sometimes with double Cs, occasionally with G, like Welsh. And this word, I never know how to pronounce it in English because when I see it, I don't even think in English. I just think in Welsh because it's so, well, obvious. Here's what it would be in Welsh today. Eglwys Vechan. And you can see how that double C happened. There's, there's an emphasis on the original part of the word which causes you to stop for a minute. And... Even in older Welsh, it was spelled that way in many cases. North England, you get places with eglwys, eglis. And so there's a variation, and this lends credence to the theory that maybe we actually have two languages emerging out of a, a very long arc, a continuum of the same language, but we don't know. One of those G ones I really want to include is Tereglis. And this is interesting because it shows us it had the er before vowels, the word the, which means that it probably had the word a uh as the word the as well. So in 1359, this place was recorded as Trevariglis. I mean, to any Welsh speaker, that's just Trevariglis, the church of the town or the town's church. And you get places like Penrithoch. Well, I don't know how they pronounce it in English. I know exactly what it would be in Welsh. Penrithog, the ruddy promontory or headland or the bloody sticking up of land. It suggests crimson red. Penrithog. And you get that in Penrith as well. Penrith. What we have here is a question of how close are they? The whole Brythonic family is on a spectrum as it is. You have Breton and Cornish, which are far closer to each other than they are Welsh. But because Breton was so influenced by French and Latin to a greater degree, it definitely went its own way as a language from Cornish. And Cornish, I as a Welsh speaker can read Cornish and I can get, I get what it is. I'd say it's just over that periphery of being its own language, just. It is definitely its own language. But is Cumbric its own language? Well, we don't have any written sources, or rather we do. 
because Old Welsh was written in that area. Was it being written there before it diverged? Or is what has passed down to us from the earliest Welsh poetry, is this Cumbric? Because it's certainly in a dialect, not completely familiar to a Welsh speaker today like Pais de Nogad. I'm going to read you a very short poem, I think it's like 17 lines, of the only thing that we really have which vaguely suggests that it was written in this dialect, or that it kept some type of original elements of it. This is called Pace to No God, and it's a lullaby. It's about a mother talking to her child about her father's hunting in the mountains. Pace to No God, Vraith, Vraith, O Groin Blawod, Ban Wraith. Chwyd chwyd chwydogaeth, gochanun gocheni nwyth geith, paneli de da di helia, llatharia squid llorini lao, ev gweli gun gogahug, gif gif dali dali dug dug, ev llethi bys gynghorug, mawbyn llad llew llew yug, paneli de da di fanydd, Thi the Gaev, Pen Yurch, Pen Gwithuch, Pen Heave, Pen Grigior Vraith o Vanith, Pen Pisk, or Rither Derwinith, or Salid Gurhaivai de Da di Aigi Gwine, O Withuch a Llewin, a Llewinine, Midangayoch, Nivayo Radine. So you can see, or any Welsh speaker could, that this is. At that point, at least, it's still the same language. However, there's one dialect difference that's very that's very different to anything we've had in Welsh of Wales that's recorded. And that's the head bit, the, the head of the animals, pen, the head of the stag, the head of the fish. And that's, it's not using it for saying that he's carrying the heads, but it represents the, the whole thing or the life of that animal as representing he's taken that, carrying it with him back. That quantifying value to head is not really present in Welsh, and that's a difference that's very unique to this poem. You also get derwenith, which it is derwen water, and arrived derwenith, the waterfall at the southern end of it. But we're not sure if that's just the Welsh name for it, or the Welsh transcription of it from a Cumbric source, or if the name changed slightly. Because you get that Y double D ending quite a bit, or in a few places up in that region, like Carlewelith for Carlisle. And in the old poetry, there's a, there's a couple bits like that. And maybe that Y double D was very common in Cumbric. This appears maybe to be an influence from Pictish for the north. So you see from Pais to Nogad, there are some differences between Welsh and Cumbric, but it's not enough to sever it apart as a language, a separate language. And we may have scribes that were writing and saying, well, this is sort of what we can understand. They were writing it in Welsh. We don't know. Now, the earliest Welsh poem, the kind of epic Welsh poem, Gdothan, this was about uh, a battle up in the Old North, or Rhenogwedd. And you can see from this poem that well, at that point in time, it's not a separate language, but this was quite early. It may have diverged later. And there were changes that did come later, which throws that into being possible. But I don't really think it was a separate language as we classify languages. Maybe in the far north, where there were different cultural influences. We also have to understand that this language was under social and political pressures which were very different to Wales. During the later parts of Cymbric and the Kingdom of Strathclyde, it was the only Welsh or Cymbric or Brythonic speaking kingdom up there in the north. The Welsh during this time had multiple kingdoms interacting with each other. Their linguistic situation was much more pluralistic and safe. The Kingdom of Strathclyde, which gradually became absorbed out of existence into the Kingdom of Scotland, didn't have that to fall back on. When they went out 
they went out and you didn't have other kingdoms still surviving. Now earlier on you had the kingdom of Ragad, the Gedothan, smaller ones here and there, Elved for the south, and they held out quite a long time. The kingdom of Strathclyde pushed back in the 10th century, expanded its land and reached down towards Lancaster, conquering a great distance between York and Glasgow in the 10th century before falling under pressure again. But it, to the north had cultural influences, but the Welsh didn't to such an extent so close on their borders. They had Picts earlier on to the northeast. And this was a Brythonic language that was not Latinized like Welsh was. We're pretty sure of that now. And it might have had a K system, we're not sure. It was like Welsh, but without the Roman influence. And you also had the Irish coming in, and it would have had a stronger, more harsh presence of the Anglic kingdoms having taken Caerredin or Edinburgh, which came from their language, Dunedin the stronghold of Aden. And so those influences would have affected Cumbric in a very different way to Welsh. And that could be said as not evidence, but it backs up the theory that at least toward the northern periphery of this long range that Cumbric was in, you could have had another language forming, especially toward Loch Lomond and the area between that and Ayrshire. The word the is very specific to knowing if it was a different language. You get that across the Romance languages. The word the is different for each language. And the Celtic languages are no different. In Cornish, you just have an, which is the. And in Welsh, it's er, a, uh, and apostrophe r after the vowel. And in Breton, it's an as well, but you'll see it r and al. So you see that there's a common bit with this er bit and an. And then Cumbric has both of these two. Sort of like Breton does, but more like it's a fusion of both Cornish and Welsh. So it has apostrophe R we know, we think, and apostrophe N we think, which suggests, I mean, this is all from place names, that kind of evidence, etymology. So we think that it had er or a uh as well before a consonant and an. In my opinion, what that is is more of evidence rather that we're seeing two different languages across the south and eastern bits. I would expect this to be Welsh. And in the far northwest, where there are different influences, this could have been, well, Cymric perhaps. Or it could have been just a dialectic spectrum from Welsh into the beginnings of another language. That's my opinion. What do you think? Do you think Cymric is its own language? We don't have much evidence. It's Welsh that changed and continued to change and grow. Cymric died out, certainly at the latest, latest, by the year 1300. It didn't have the opportunity, maybe, to become a separate language. But maybe it did, because there's some differences in spelling and sounds, which are quite unique. There are a couple sounds that don't quite appear in Welsh, or, or combinations of sounds, or lack thereof, which do appear for the north. We get this hinted at in place names. So, Kudamuk Walter. This is earlier on recorded as Kurumbuk, water. And that would have meant Kurumbog, or Kurumog in Welsh. Curved. Kurumog. And that U M B sound, umbora. And that would be today Llyn Kurumog for Kurumog water. But you have that difference, and it's very subtle, and it's not enough to divert it as a language, but it is a difference that we know was there. And it's preserved in the name Cumbria, the county. One thing that's interesting in the Scots law books, or the early kingdom of Scotland's law books, is you have a term, Galanus. And in Welsh, this is Galanus. And what this means is when someone murdered someone, they were expected to be paid or their family would be paid for that loss. It was a compensation system for victims. 
and you'll notice that the middle vowel is swallowed out in the Cymric word for this. And it suggests that the accent has shifted one way or the other. The accent may have been different where it was between Cymric and Welsh. Again, that does not show that it's a different language. It shows significant divergence was possible, which could have been leading to a language. Vanku, yonder, can you see the obelisk? wouldn't even know what words like over there mean in Cambric. That's how little we have. But we do have a few personal names. Quite a few, and they're basically Welsh. Except there are a couple interesting differences. The W drops out sometimes. A W in certain names was lost. Name of the word for servant. So in Welsh, gwas is servant. But it appears that in Cumbric it was Gauss. That's a significant difference, but we don't have many of these names. But here are some of them Gauss Patrick, the servant of the Saint Patrick, Gauss Mungo, the servant of Saint Mungo, Gauss Oswald, the servant of Oswald. And so that's one difference. It suggests that the vowels were shortening, which is also an indication of language death in the long run of things. In some cases, not all. One thing that we know is that Cymric went extinct and one thing that would have possibly lent the idea that it could have been in a separate language is the process that languages go through toward becoming extinct a lot more single syllable and shorter words. This happened in Cornish. You use a lot fewer adjectives and descriptive words. And there's a spike in loan words always in terms of language death from a single other language. You overloan words. In the case of Cornish, it was English at the end that they borrowed and borrowed and borrowed words from. And Cymric, if it went through this process, it likely would have become another language as it was dying. Because of that process, it would have made it so different to Welsh. But I don't think it was a language on its own for the hundreds of years that it was spoken there. I think it it changed a little bit, and it certainly was a dialect, maybe as far apart as, almost, as Czech and Slovak. There's still arguments whether they speak a different language there. Cornish and Breton and Welsh, they're as different from each other in some cases as Catalan and Spanish. Those are different languages. And I wonder what it must have been like. Were they aware, as the language was dying, what was happening? Who were the last speakers, and how did they feel? We know that the area just to the south of Edinburgh, around the area of Cardrona, Cardrona would have been Cardruina, the stronghold of the promontories, true in his nose, in Welsh today. Same thing, really. Another area that was strong in terms of Cumbric was the area to the east of Catalisle and into the mountains a bit south. But I wonder how those last linguistic communities felt. Were they aware of each other even in the time? The ones that were just to the south of Edinburgh and the ones toward Carlisle, those last pockets of Cumbric speakers in the 13th century, 
Did they know each other existed? Which one was the last to survive? We don't know these basic things because there's no evidence. We just have those personal names, like I said. And did it feel like a sunset? Have a look at this. The sun setting over a Gogarth and Unus Mon. As happened quite often in this part of the world, the sunset did not agree with my plans. So, please let me know what you think about it. Do you think that Cumbric is a language, or do you think it's a dialect of Welsh? Or do you think, as well, that there were two things going on? Let me do down in the comments. And as always, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next episode.